Hey everyone, welcome to Worship at the Rock. We are so excited that you could be with us tonight. Tonight we're looking forward to another amazing night of teaching. Hi guys, I am Pastor John, and I am so glad to be bringing you this week our communion. Now, we haven't done communion in a little while, but this week I am kind of wrapping up my short series on making decisions. And really what it comes down to is, you know, knowing when it is that God wants you to say yes and when he wants you to say no. Because the problem is that if we say yes to something that the devil wants us to say yes to, and we sin against God, separating us from God, it's very, very bad. Okay? And this is why we have to sit down and do communion every once in a while, because we need to make ourselves right with God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't always, I don't sit down every single day and take communion, or basically do the same thing that we are doing when we take communion, which is making ourselves right with God. Now, I do talk to God every day. I do spend time with him, and I do learn from him, and he teaches me lots of things. But the one thing that I probably should be doing more often is taking a moment and writing myself before him. Now, and I'm saying this because I think that most Christians today, they forget that we need to make ourselves right before him. Because if we are not right before him, we come to him seeking things, wanting to learn, wanting to grow, wanting to grow closer to him. It's kind of like, well, think about, think about your, um, a parent with a child, okay? The child is out playing in the yard, and they find something that looks like a little cat with a little wh white stripe down its back. Know where I'm going with this? It's a skunk. That skunk sprays that child, and I don't care how much you love your child unconditionally. Yes, you're going to clean your child up, but when your child comes to you and they want to give you a big hug and they want to cry in your arms because they stink, you're going to hold them at arm's length because they stink. You don't want to smell like that. The problem is that our sin makes us stink before God. And he has to keep us at arm's length, in essence, because sin is separating us from him. And he doesn't have a choice. I mean, he sent his son to be sacrificed on the cross for your sins and for mine. All we have to do is seek his forgiveness. This is not a once and done thing. You know, I can, you know, I can very plainly say I am saved. I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. But that doesn't mean that if I go out and I rob a convenience store, that it's not a sin because once upon a time I sought God's, uh, Christ's forgiveness for my sin. That's not a once and done thing, okay? So we need to seek forgiveness on a regular basis because guess what? You sin on a regular basis, right? Okay, now this is not supposed to be turning into a sermon here, so I am not going to be drawing this out. But here's the point, guys. Make the right decisions. When God says, I want you to go talk to that person and witness to them, go do it. When God says, I don't want you to walk into that building, then don't do it. You know, I recently had a situation come up with the tires on my truck, and before that it was one of the, there was a noise being made. So I stopped, I, I put it off, put it off, put it off, and one day I just said, you know what, I need to get in. Something inside of me is telling me I need to get into the shop. I took it in to a friend of mine, and they opened it up, and 
did the work. They called me up and they said, yeah, it was a, it was a wheel bearing. Good thing you brought it in when you did because your wheel would have fallen off if you had driven probably another mile or two. I mean, it was on the verges just snapping. And it was the driver front tire. I could have ended up in the hospital, could have ended up dead for all I know. But that there was a voice that was speaking to me, telling me, get it in now. And I did. And I got it in just in time. I, my tires were a uh, factory defect recently. And once again, got them in just in time because even though it wasn't, it wasn't terrible, it wasn't making a bad sound, it was just a slight vibration, I got them in just in time before I pretty much lost my tires. And so here's the deal, guys. When God's telling you to do something, just do it. Even if it seems stupid or if it seems like there's no point or if it seems like, you know, why should I have to do this now? I could wait till later. Or, well, I just don't feel like it. It's, it's not comfortable for me. Just do it. God wants you to do it. Do it. And that's the same thing with communion. You know, we, not everybody wants to do communion all the time. But you know what? It's something that we do because, because God asks us to do it. So, I think you've had plenty of time. Please take, get your communion out. Um, I have this cool little uh, cracker and juice communion cup. And so that's what I'm going to be doing today. And I'm just going to quickly read through uh, the passages in uh, Mark chapter 14, chapter, starting in chapter 22. Um, it's, uh, this is Jesus here, and it says, As they were eating, Jesus took some of the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. You know, we take the bread because his body was broken on the cross for us. Without him being tortured and put up on that cross, we would not have the opportunity that we have today to seek salvation for our sins. Salvation that was necessary from the time of Adam and Eve sinning in the garden. This is the fulfillment of God's promise. That one day, he would make things right. We have this opportunity. So, take the bread with me. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to not die on the cross. He would be raised from the dead. And that we would be made whole because he was broken. Verse 23, and he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to our God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it in the new or in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Now blood that was shed, the blood that covers our sins, makes us pure and holy. Without this blood, we would be covered in nasty, disgusting sins that separate us from God. When God looks at us, he sees the blood of his Son. Think about that, just for, just for a moment. If you had a child, and your child sacrificed himself or herself or someone else. People think, well, you know, I, I've thought about this. I've heard of other people thinking about this too, that why would God love us when his son died for us? Wouldn't he hate us for that? No. See, his son died so that we could live. If, 
your child died to save someone else's life, that person came before you, you would want that person to live as well. Because that was the reason for the death of your child. Now Jesus Christ not only died for our sins, but he rose again. Because honestly, his death would have been pointless if he had not risen from the dead. But his blood is what covers us. Because we are marked with the blood of Christ, the Father doesn't look at our sins. He sees the love of his Son for you and for me. Thank you, Lord, for... Thank you for your Son. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for looking past who we are, who we were, and only seeing the pure and holy vessels that we can be because of the blood of your Son, Yeshua Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being so giving and so gracious and so loving. You gave us your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, take of the wine. Okay. I hope you all got a little something out of this. This is the last message of my series on making decisions. Making good decisions, the right decisions. Your yes be yes and your no be no. Until next week, guys, have a great week, and I'll see you next week for the Torah portion. Shabbat Shalom. Now, please join us for a weekly full gospel Torah portion with Messianic Pastor Dale. Hi, I am Messianic Pastor Dale Branch, and this is this week's full gospel Torah portion. Our Torah portion this week is called Pinchas or in English, Phineas. It begins in uh, Numbers, chapters 25, verse 10, through chapter 30, verse 1. And uh, it begins like this. It's, it's a census of the generation that's about to enter the Promised Land. Now, that's a big chunk of this passage. And like Numbers, and pretty much the whole book it is a long long list with a lot of math and you can get into it yourself but they break it down by the tribe and by the clans and all of their numbers and um but what's cool is this is the generation that um it's about to cross over cross over the jordan right and and it says that there is no one left alive except for uh, joshua and Caleb, and of course Moses, uh, left over from the previous generation that had um, left Egypt and crossed over the Red Sea. The next important thing in this passage is uh, Moses appoints Joshua to be his successor at God's command. And then it follows up with a review of the prescribed offerings for the daily, weekly, and monthly sacrifices, as well as, of course, for the major festivals of the Lord that uh, you can look up and read is listed in, in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, our Haftorah portion, um, there's, there's two different portions. Uh, one is in the book of Jeremiah. But there is an alternative reading which I've chosen for uh, for tonight. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. And, and it's about Elijah. I love Elijah. It's such a great story. And, and in this particular chapter, um, it's immediately following his, his amazing uh, moment of fame. Right where he had gone up on the mountain and challenged the prophets of Baal, and the and if you're familiar with the story, you know uh, Baal lost, 
and um, God showed up with power and might and rained fire from heaven and burned up Elijah's offering and sacrifice and the altar and all the water that was around it. And everybody was amazed and his people uh, fell down and repented and and uh, there was a massive uh, return back to the Lord. And, uh, and then they celebrated by slaughtering all of the prophets of Baal, some 400 of them. So uh, this passage starts up immediately after that event. And as you can imagine, King Ahab and his queen Jezebel are uh, PO'd in a major way. And uh, they've threatened his life and they're actively hunting him with everything that they can intent on killing him. So Elijah is literally fleeing for his life. And, um, and the bad part is, you know, he's got no friends. He has no family. All of his uh, prophet buddies have already been slaughtered and put to death by Ahab and Jezebel. And, and he finds himself lost and uh, completely alone. Not, not geographically lost, but just this feeling of all is lost. Right? He had this incredible thing happen. It was awesome. Um, but, you know, he's just wallowing in despair, um, fleeing for his life. Right? He's terrified. And it says that, that Elijah lays down under a broom bush. He's hiding in the wilderness, right? And, and he prays to God to take his life, right? He prays to die. That's, that is how, uh, how dire of a situation he's in, right? He just, he wants it to be over and, and he passes out from, from, I think, sheer exhaustion. And, and then an angel wakes him up. And, uh, and feeds him, uh, not once, but twice. Like, how awesome is that? Now, I mean, I think it'd be amazing just to see an angel, but, you know, I bet they're good cooks, right? So he's got bread, hot bread, and, and water. It's just supernaturally shows up, right? And the angel feeds him. And then God calls him on a journey. To the wilderness. I love it when God calls people to the wilderness because God wants to meet us in the wilderness where He kind of strips us bare of everything and gets to the heart of the matter. And, and He meets Elijah in the wilderness. He had to walk 40 days and nights to get there, right? That's what it says. So He had to go a long ways and God meets Him there. Now we have the famous. A passage that we all know, right? And the, the wind showed up and God wasn't in it, right? And the earthquake showed up and God wasn't in it. And then the fire showed up and God wasn't in it. But then a still small voice was heard and God began to speak to Elijah. And I love this part because God goes and he asks Elijah, why are you here? Why are you here? I love that. That's so powerful, and we're going to come back to that, right? And and then God begins to, you know, have, of course, Elijah answers what he thinks is his answer. And then God begins to give Elijah instructions. And he tells Elijah, go back the way you came. Go back where you came from. And you're going to appoint three men. You're going to anoint them and appoint them. Two of them to be leaders, kings of two different regions. But the third man you're going to anoint is going to be Elisha. And he's going to be your successor. Such awesome stuff in that short passage. And we're going to come back to some of it. Our new covenant portion is John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Again, uh, a very familiar passage, right? It's, uh, it's you know, Passover time. Um, 
and and Jesus is entering the temple, and uh, and he sees what's going around. He takes a look, and and he's clearly upset. He sits down and he makes a whip, right? So this is a he didn't grab a whip and react in like some kind of like, you know, frenetic. Um, I can't think of the word impulsive manner, right? It says he fashioned a whip, right? This was premeditated, people. Like Jesus had knew exactly what he was going to do. And he was not happy, right? So he goes in, he's got his whip, and he causes a huge scene, right? He starts flinging this whip around. He's throwing things. He's overturning the tables, right? We've got birds going everywhere, and the, the sheep are freaking out, and the, the cows are freaking out, and the people are freaking out, and, you know, money is flying everywhere, and... Um, can you imagine if we did that in church? Yeah, you know, right there in front of everybody. Just started tossing everything upside down, right? Um, yeah, that probably wouldn't look very good. But that's what happened. Now, what's interesting about this story, and I want to take a minute, is because I want to paint a picture, right? It's Jerusalem. It's 30-ish A.D., right? The Roman Empire is in full effect. Passover is one of the three major uh, holidays where all the Jews, males especially, uh, over the age of 20, they have to come to Jerusalem to the temple. It's mandatory. You've got two million Jews coming from all over the world. To observe Passover from all over the world, right? So you have global currencies, right? They've traveled long distances, right? They didn't bring their pet sheep with them, right? They're going to go there. They've got strange money. They got to exchange it. They have to buy a sheep or, or a cow or pigeons or whatever it is that they have to buy. And the people, the merchants are there to help them out and make a little cash on the side, right? Yeah, it's good business. It's great business, right? It's one of the biggest holidays of the year, right? There's only three times when Jerusalem has that many people. So, hey, we're going to make a little uh, something something, right? Now, what's crazy, right, is they're doing this because the people have to fulfill the prescribed laws for these festivals exactly as they were prescribed by God and given to Moses. The very things that, that are listed in the book of Numbers that we were just reading. So it's really easy for people to go, what in the world were they doing wrong? Why was Jesus so, like, angry? I want to talk to you today about pink slips. Of all the things that I saw in these passages as I was studying for this evening, it occurred to me that it's about pink slips. You know, Moses served God faithfully for 40 years. 40 years he led the most stubborn, obstinate, aggravating people on the planet through the worst of circumstances, faithfully obeying God, 40 years, no pension plan, and at the end, 
God tells him, hey, Moses, they're about to cross over, but you're not going. It's, it's look, I, I really appreciate everything that you've done, you know, um, here's a gold watch, but it's time to pass the torch. And, and I want you to, to appoint Joshua, and he's going to take over from here. Well, not quite, right? Because you have a few things left to do, right? So it's like, here's your pink slip, but, you know, it's kind of like a, a one-month notice, right? You got some stuff to finish up before you can hand over the reins. A pink slip. You know, Elisha, right? Prophet, powerful, mighty, respected, honored throughout all the land. The last of his kind. Everybody else is already dead. And God calls him into this very intimate place. Powerful moment, wind, earthquake, fire. Awesome. Hey. Dude, you've done an amazing job. And uh, you've run an amazing race. And I love you, buddy. But, uh, but it's time to pass the torch. Here's your pink slip. Here's your pink slip. I want you to go point two new kings and... And there's this young man over here that I want you to raise up. I want you to raise up. It's time for somebody else to begin to take your place. Anoint him. Give him some of your, the spirit, the mantle that, that I put upon you. And, and take, you know, take good care of him. Because, because he He's the new generation. Wow, pink slips. And then you got Jesus, right? He walks in and and he's kicking people out of the temple. They're just doing their job. And and he's like, like, you know, at least Elijah got a you know a severance package, right? He got the chariot of fire and the whole bit, right? Right, straight up to heaven, right? God buried Moses himself. Like, talk about honor. But Jesus walks in. These poor schmucks are doing their job. And he's beating them with a whip. You're fired! Right? Think of Donald Trump. You're fired! They didn't realize what was going on. They're just trying to make a buck. You know? Pink slips. Whatever the reason is and whatever our position is, whatever it is that we're doing, I realize that regardless of our calling, our ministry, our, our status in life, um, there comes a time in everything where God hands us a pink slip. And says, your time is done. It's time to move on. It's time to transition. It's time to raise up somebody else and let them take over from here. And that can be really hard. That can be really hard because our, our livelihoods might be wrapped up in it. Our, our identities might be wrapped up in it. It can be hard to let go and, and trust God. I don't know what you're dealing with today, this week, this month, this year, but, um, but maybe there's somebody out there where God's been trying to hand you a pink slip and, uh, and you've been fighting it. And I just want to encourage you that. 
that if it's time to let go, it's okay. God's got you. And he has incredible plans for what's next, not for just for you and, and your family, but, but also for the one that is supposed to pick up and take the torch from there. I hope you have a fantastic week and a wonderful Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. Please join us as we dig in a little deeper with a time of teaching with Pastor Jim. Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Jim with Worship at the Rock Ministries. Tonight, we're going to do part three of the power of God's words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We see in Genesis chapter one that... Uh, the word of God was spoken and things were brought into creation. So words have a power to create. And so God spoke and said, let there be light on the first day. And there was light and he divided it into the morning and the evening. The evening being the darker portion. And then uh, he spoke on the second day, and third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Then he rested on the seventh. Now, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Word made flesh as Messiah and the firstborn Son of God. We can go back to Genesis, and as the Lord was speaking his words, creation happened. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, hovered over the waters. So that's in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 3, I think. Okay. The Hebrew language, the Aleph Bet, is the language that Moses used and, and the early proto-synactic form of text there was cuneiform back then and there was the hebrew and there may have been other languages don't know wasn't there but uh the hebrew alphabet the aleph bet was in use when moses wrote the scriptures and tablets and i imagine that tablets with the ten commandments were written in hebrew in the early Hebrew language. So down here on the right, you see the Hebrew alphabet and the early form of how the alphabet was printed out. And we're going to go into this picture right here that shows the Aleph, which is the first letter. And we need to remember that the Letter A or Aleph, in our language A, Aleph, is silent. And if you look here, it looks like a ram's head. It's very interesting. And then the last letter, Aleph Ta, it says Tav here, but Ta, T-A-U, looks like a cross. Now, the cross was changed to a side cross that looked more like a sword in the uh, middle or 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Somewhere in the middle to 70 years of the Babylonian captivity, they changed the ram skull to a, a symbol and they changed the cross to more like a crooked cross or a sword. Uh, later, 
and I would think somewhere probably the early to late Middle Ages, the Aleph was changed to this symbol. And then in the 1920s, it took its current shape of Aleph. Now the Tav remained a crooked cross in the, up to the Middle Ages from Babylon on. And then uh, in the late Middle Ages, it took its current form. So that that's hadn't changed much. Now the Hebrew alphabet is shown here with four different transitions and symbols. So you can follow it that way, but put it a little better that timing, some of the first languages of the world included the Hebrew language. There have been several versions, as we said. The first day to Babylon captivity was the proto-synactic script in which the ram's head represented Aleph. Now, the, the Aleph, ram's head, and the ta, that was the cross, first day of the use of the Hebrew language now, till the time they were carted to Babylon, and during the 70 years in Babylon, they changed the symbols of a lot of the Hebrew language. But who used the early? Uh, anybody that wrote anything down in the early days? I'm not saying Adam and Eve, but it could have been, or their children, or Noah, or definitely Moses when he wrote the Torah and the laws and some of the prophets like Isaiah, um, Jeremiah, maybe Ezekiel. He was in that transition time. Daniel was in that transition time. So Daniel may have or may not. At least when he first started in Babylon, Daniel used the earliest forms of writing out the Hebrew language. Okay, so during the Babylonian captivity, they came out with the Talmud, which was a fence to help the Hebrew nation not sin against God. And that's where they got all the extra laws that uh, Yeshua and the uh, Pharisees battled over and uh, fussed about all the laws on the Sabbath, uh, certain things as his disciples, Yeshua, Jesus' disciples, pulled some grain off the stocks and ate them and spit out what didn't taste right or was hulls and husks and uh, so they harvested they ground the wheat with their teeth and so there was two or three bad things right there just in that action so there were uh, 612 or 13 laws in the uh, Torah and uh, they had uh, about 1,500 laws just on the Sabbath, which was one of the laws. Anyway, we'll get into it. Uh, a lot of laws about the Sabbath. Babylon to 1920, uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Somewhere in the Middle Ages, there was a number three. And then... Uh, the modern since 1920 is the way the Hebrew language has been written. Now, the beginning Hebrew language, the Aleph, the first letter, looks like a ram's head. And the letter Aleph is silent. It has no sound. And the silent ram, lamb. Jesus was silent before his accusers unto the end at the cross. Aleph, ta. Aleph begins with the ram's head. Ta ends with the cross. And so Yeshua was born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, as the perfect sacrificial 
Lamb of God, wrapped in swaddling clothes. So he started out as a ram. And think about when uh, Abraham was taking Isaac. Isaac, who was in his 30s, about the age of Yeshua Jesus, to sacrifice him. Wow. He wasn't some little kid. That 30-something-year-old Isaac allowed his dad, Abraham, a 130-year-old man, to tie him up. And he probably had to hop up on this altar by himself or with a little bit of help. But it was just him and his dad, Abraham. And Abraham swung that knife back. And the angel said, no, there's a ram caught in the bush and thickets. And the ram's horns were hooked into the bushes somehow. There's your sacrificial lamb, the substitute. And what was Yeshua Jesus? He was our sacrificial lamb that took the beating, that took the stripes, and died on the cross willingly. Why do I say willingly? Because love for his father God, Elohim, kept him on that cross to do his father's will. Why? Because he told one of the disciples, Peter, when Peter cut the servant of the high priest's ear off with a sword, he puts the ear back on, he's healed, and he says, put that sword away. Don't you know I can bring out 12 legions of angels to defend me? And it only took one legion of angels to wipe out the Assyrian army at one time. One angel. So uh, 12 legions, a lot of angels. And he, he could have at any time, just as the uh, Pharisees and priests and chief priests was were yelling up to him, come down from that cross and we'll believe that you're the Messiah and we'll believe that you're the king of the Jews. But nope, he stayed on that cross, strung out, and bled to death and died for our sins as a perfect sacrificial lamb. So the Aleph, first letter, the Hebrew alphabet, up to Daniel and Babylon, and uh, was the ram's head. And then... The top, the cross, that's where he ended. So when he said, I am the Alpha and Omega in Hebrew, he, if he would have said it in Hebrew, I am the Aleph, Ta, the beginning and the end. So he is the beginning and the end of the Word of God, and the Word of God was in Hebrew. So all these things picked, putting together is pretty Pretty strong case that he was the Son of God. He was the Word of God made flesh. He was the Alpha Omega, the Aleph Ta, the A to Z, however you want to phrase it. But a ram's head, the early symbol for Aleph, and it was a silent letter. He spoke not and didn't protest. Just went through the mock trial, went through Pilate's hearing, and went on, got beat, and didn't scream out and cry when he was beat and punched. That's why Pilate said, behold the man. He's like, there's the man. He was silent the whole time. Just like a lamb is when they get slaughtered at the slaughterhouse. Okay. Um, Yeshua Jesus said, I'm the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. Now, why Alpha and Omega? Because the cheap books, even the Torah, were written in Greek. The Greeks had a way of reproducing things, and so... He said, that's Greek to me, but he is the Aleph Ta. First letter in Hebrew is a silent Aleph. It's originally the ram's head, just as we've spoken in the last letter. Here's a little crooked cross. We look at it a little more closely, 
And if you can see the pointer pointing to the ram's head, it's enlarged. So you can see that. Oh, yeah, that does look up. Looks like a stare. Looks like a cow's head. But what was Jesus? He was the perfect lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice sent to the world to ah, the cross. The beginning, perfect lamb, perfect lamb, which was a male lamb that was sacrificed every day, first in the morning at nine or three o'clock in the evening sacrifice, perfect male lamb was sacrificed. And an older male lamb is a ram with horns. And he was 33, so he was a ram for the sacrifice on the tar, the cross. Anyway, we've talked about, well, on this slide, it tells the versions of first day of Babylon capture, proto-synactic script, and then Babylon to whenever the late Middle Ages the changes, and then the modern in 1920. So I was looking at it a little more in depth. So um, we will move on. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John had studied a little bit about the creation, and he knew that Jesus was with God at the very beginning before the foundation of the earth and the world and the heavens and the universe. And so Jesus, our Messiah, Yeshua, was the flesh, the word of God made flesh. Verse 2, and the same was in the beginning. All things were made by him, meaning the word of God made all things. And without him, nothing was made because the word of God created all of these things. And in him was life and life was the light of man. And the light shineth in the dark and the darkness doesn't understand it. And he was misunderstood for sure. John 15, 7, if you abide in me, this is what Yeshua, Jesus is saying to his disciples after the dinner, what we call the Last Supper, which was actually a Passover Seder. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will, and it shall be done. That's supposed to be done unto you. I'm going to have to correct that. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples if my words abide in you. And he had later talked to him and said, my Father told me what I should say when I come into the world. And if my words that the Father told me to give to you Abide in you, and you abide in my word, studying to show yourself approved, that kind of thing. Then uh, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Okay? So you ask not, you get not. But if you're abiding in his word and in the vine, you ask in Jesus, Yeshua's name, and Father will do it, but you can't be asking amiss like for a million dollars or Mercedes Benz or all kinds of stuff, crazy stuff, but in the will of the Lord, ask what you need. Jesus is Lord. You're in his plan. You, you speak his promises. You, you have to pour out. His words, his promises, God's words, God's promises. God has a plan and you're in it. And his plan, are you living it? The ball's in your court. God gave you the free will to stay or go. So I hope your free will is choosing to abide in the vine and let Jesus' words abide in you and you abide in them. 
and live it. All right, uh, we had a shorter lesson tonight because we had the communion and thanking Pastor John for doing the communion for us tonight. That's something we need to do from time to time just to stay linked in, uh, keeping short accounts, as we always say. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. There'll be some announcements and you can always go to graceandtruthmagazine.com slash TV and see Worship at the Rock and the lessons and, and all that, that entails. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you for being with us tonight. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord protect you and keep you under his wings. The Lord guide you by his Holy Spirit. The Lord's kindness and love track you down and allow you and your family to abide in his shalom peace that passes all understanding. May he bless and keep you always in the mighty name of Yeshua Jesus. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for joining us for another amazing night of worship and diving into the word of God. We hope to see you next week for another wonderful night of teaching. Thank you so much to all of our friends and partners for your prayers and financial support. The best way you can give is to go to graceandtruthmagazine.com, select donations, then online giving. Your prayers and financial support are what empower us to keep building the kingdom. What we sow today comes back in our tomorrow as an amazing harvest. Until next week, Shabbat Shalom.